One evening, I sat at our table going through my daughter Katie's medical forms. Katie was preparing to start kindergarten, so she had a thorough checkup from the pediatrician. Meanwhile, my wife left her school forms spread out on the table. Glancing lazily at them, I noticed a letter that marked the end of my marriage. In the blood type column, it read, A. I froze for about ten seconds, utterly clueless. I then went to the cabinet and fetched two sheets of paper from our medical records. Everything matched my recollection perfectly. Last summer, both my wife and I donated blood to the Red Cross, receiving receipts indicating our blood type. Here they were on two sheets of paper. Mine was B, hers was O. So Katie couldn't possibly be my daughter. If my wife was her mother and I witnessed Marie giving birth, then someone with blood type A had to be the father. The kids were already asleep, and Marie was upstairs watching TV. I grabbed a beer from the fridge and sat in the backyard contemplating the state of my marriage. I'd say it was okay, pretty average, with its fair share of ups and downs. When we were dating and in the early stages of marriage, Marie and I were deeply in love. We were carnal all the time, sometimes passionately, even outside of the bedroom. We were always touching, holding hands, walking side by side, caressing each other as we passed by. Naturally, over time, that faded. Isn't that how it goes in most marriages? But now, faced with undeniable proof of her infidelity, everything I thought about our marriage was shaken. I pondered, what changed? Was it gradual or sudden? It felt like both. The decline in our closeness was gradual initially. However, about six years ago, a few months before Katie was conceived, things took a strange turn. Marie, typically warm and loving, started acting oddly. One evening, she came home from work very late, allowed me a brief tender kiss, then hurried to the shower and avoided me for the rest of the night. The next morning was just as chilly and distant. But that night, she was a different person entirely. She came home early, cooked a special dinner, tucked me into bed early, and made love to me with a fervor and passion I thought we'd lost. We cuddled happily before sleep, and Marie expressed her love for me. Several times that week, we shared passionate moments. Then, the coldness returned abruptly. She arrived late from work, didn't utter a word to me, and swiftly disappeared into the shower. For the next two months, I hardly recognized the woman I married. Marie was affectionate and distant, attentive and preoccupied, patient and irritable. I asked her numerous times if something was wrong, if there were issues between us or at work. Her only response was to express uncertainty to Bill, admitting that she might just be feeling a bit nervous and apologizing for it. When things eventually settled after about three months, it was far from the joyful beginning of our marriage. Marie became less moody, but she was rarely affectionate anymore, and her interest in closeness vanished. We made love no more than once a week, sometimes even less frequently, and only when I insisted firmly. Any gentle suggestion, like maybe we could be carnal tonight, was met with sharp rejection. I had to seriously address the long lap since our last carnal moment. Marie would reluctantly engage in lovemaking afterward, making it evident she was merely obliging me. Is this dismal pattern common in all marriages? It was the only marriage I carnally knew, so I couldn't say. Naturally I pondered what was happening, contemplating the possibility of infidelity. However, soon after, Marie became pregnant, and our shared excitement over our future baby, and the joy of having our wonderful Katie, overshadowed most of my concerns about our relationship. After Katie's birth, we were constantly exhausted, making Marie's disinterest in lovemaking more understandable, though still unsatisfactory to me. Then, when Katie turned three, Marie became pregnant again, and we welcomed Brian just after Katie's fourth birthday. So Bill and Marie, once passionate lovers and spouses, transitioned into Bill and Marie, parents of two delightful yet exhausting children. We both cherished our kids deeply. Despite my current realization of my profound unhappiness with our marriage and our nearly non-existent lovemaking life, I was oblivious to it at the time. If that was the case, then I concluded that all couples with young children experience this phase. With the startling revelation that my daughter wasn't biologically mine, the events of six years ago no longer seemed mysterious. Marie must have initiated an affair around that time. This explained her distant behavior and sudden rush to the shower. The subsequent passionate lovemaking and warmth could be attributed to guilt, or perhaps if I were being generous, to her attempt to maintain the facade of a happy marriage 
while continuing the affair. As I sat in the yard, observing the night descend and the stars twinkle, my initial shock gave way to growing anger. Not only had my beloved wife betrayed me, but she had also deceived me into raising someone else's child, and perhaps more than one. If I were solely focused on punishing Marie at that moment, I would have stormed into the house, presented her with the evidence of blood types, coerced a confession, and cast her out onto the street. But it wasn't that simple. I cherished my children, regardless of their biological origins. If we were to divorce, Marie would likely gain sole custody once the truth about their parentage surfaced. I contemplated and asked myself, what do I truly desire? The answers became surprisingly clear. Firstly, I needed to uncover the truth about Marie's actions. Was it a fleeting affair? Was she unaware that Katie wasn't my biological child? Or did she know everything and carry on a clandestine relationship for years? Secondly, I was determined to raise my children as my own and shield them from the knowledge of my non-biological relationship to them. Once I delineated my objectives, devising a plan to achieve them seemed remarkably straightforward. I returned to the house and discreetly collected cotton swabs from each of the children's cheeks while they slept, labeling Katie's with a two and Brian's with a three. Then I headed to the kitchen, swabbed my own cheek, and marked it with a one. I had a friend who worked in a university chemistry lab, and I arranged for him to conduct DNA tests for me. This marked the initial step, the commencement of gathering crucial information. After receiving my initial response, I knew what to do next. A week later, my friend called me without knowing where the samples came from. I told him about meeting people with the same surname, leading to discussions about potential distant kinship. He then mentioned that Bills 2 and 3 were siblings, but the first one wasn't related. This revelation indicated that they weren't cousins as previously assumed. I thanked him for the information and ended the call. Katie and Brian were siblings, sharing the same parents. Marie, on the other hand, had two children with an unknown partner. Did she have knowledge of this? She must have been aware of her relations with this individual, but was she cognizant of his paternity over our children? There was a straightforward means to ascertain the truth. Approaching Marie as she washed dishes in the kitchen, I brought up the topic without turning towards her. I began by telling her I had a question, and she encouraged me to continue. I explained the situation regarding my colleague's biologist friend needing DNA samples from relatives. I suggested that we obtain swabs from her, me, and each child, planning to handle the kids before bedtime and take care of ours later. I checked Marie's reaction closely as I spoke. In the middle of my explanation, she tensed, almost dropping a pan before composing herself. After I finished, there was a minute of silence before she turned to face me. Marie expressed her doubts about the idea, questioning how we could be certain about what the biologist would do with the samples or if our privacy would be respected. Despite my attempts to argue, she firmly opposed the idea, insisting that she wasn't interested. She asked me to inform my colleague that we declined to participate. I replied softly, saying it was okay either way. Her reaction conveyed to me what I needed to know. My next step involved uncovering the truth about her affairs. Who, where, when, and perhaps why. Although uncertain, searching her home might yield clues. I required time for a thorough search. On Saturday, we planned to visit her parents. Minutes before departure, I pretended a work crisis, feigned a call, then explained the situation to Marie. She reluctantly agreed, departing with the children. Now, I had hours to comb through the house systematically. I deemed my usual haunts unnecessary to search, focusing instead on Marie's spaces. Skipping the kitchen, bookshelves, and living room, I ignored my own areas but meticulously combed through her closet and dresser. The discovery of hidden lingerie hinted at secrets. Only the children's rooms and the attic remained to explore. Concluding that the children's rooms were less promising, I ventured into the attic. Inside I found assorted old furniture, a few lamps, and numerous boxes of items predating our marriage. Realizing the enormity of the task, I scrutinized the area. Notably, one of the three nearby boxes appeared less dusty and had been recently disturbed. Upon closer inspection, I focused on these three boxes and uncovered Marie's old belongings, mostly letters from her college days. Among them were letters and keepsakes from myself, including sweet greeting cards. 
buried at the bottom of one box, concealed beneath old papers, lay a thin stack of recent notes and two unmarked videotapes. Extracting them, I discovered the tapes contained explicit content, while the notes were from Harry, her office superior, expressing overtly closeness sentiments. After scrutinizing the materials for twenty minutes, it became evident that Marie had betrayed me with Harry, beginning around three months before our daughter Katie was conceived, coinciding with Marie's peculiar behavior at home. The notes revealed a dynamic characterized by Harry's dominance and Marie's compliance, devoid of affection. They dictated her attire for various occasions and detailed their carnal encounters during late work hours. Some even ridiculed me for unknowingly raising their children. It was apparent Harry had no intention of acknowledging their paternity. My anger intensified as I realized the extent of Marie's deception, knowing Harry was happily married to Caroline, unaware of his affair. Although Marie seemed to willingly participate, there was no indication of coercion. She appeared to relish her submissive role. They both appeared to know the paternity of Marie's children and seemed to enjoy their secret over me. These revelations confirmed Marie's deceit over the past six years, deliberately conceiving children from another man while masquerading as my devoted wife. Filled with rage, I resolved to seek revenge on both Marie and Harry. After a brief moment of contemplation, I brought the tapes to the VCR and watched footage of Harry and Marie engaging in carnal acts. The setting of the earlier recording, likely Harry's house, and the more recent one in our bedroom, raised suspicions about Marie's opportunities during my business trips. Overall, the recordings affirmed Harry's closeness dominance over Marie and her eager compliance. The room's lighting wasn't particularly bright, but both figures were clearly visible, and the sound quality was surprisingly clear, allowing me to catch every word and moan on the initial tape. From the outset of their affair, I heard Harry assuming control. Seated on the bed, he directed Marie to perform a provocative strip tease, which she did with a smile. The closeness was rough, lacking tenderness or affection, and Harry spoke harshly to her. It saddened me to observe that Marie evidently enjoyed the encounter. The second tape featured similar carnal scenes, but included some fresh, intriguing dialogue as they reclined on the bed. Marie queried Harry about his indifference to me raising his children, to which he responded that I was a decent guy who loved children, and he didn't worry beyond that. He mentioned that if it weren't for that, he would advise her to leave me. Marie retorted by questioning what I was good for besides changing diapers. She expressed to Harry that it wasn't fair. Marie defended me, highlighting my kindness and love, comparing them to Harry's treatment. She hinted at being drawn to Harry's roughness because it contrasted with my gentleness. Despite this, they proceeded with their encounter before Harry's departure. Upon completing both viewings, I pondered their arrogance, not only in creating such evidence, but also in foolishly leaving it along with Harry's notes where I could find them. My retaliation would be comprehensive, targeting both of them. I utilized a scanner to digitize each note onto my hard drive. Then, using software borrowed from work for a previous project, I converted each videotape into a digital file on my hard drive for future editing. Once finished, I stashed the records and tapes in the trunk of my car, concealing them under the spare tire. I then meticulously tidied up the attic ensuring Marie remained oblivious to my presence. Over the following two weeks, I methodically executed my plans. It was much easier than I anticipated to feign normalcy with Marie, acting as if nothing unusual had occurred. It struck me that she had deceived me for six years, making it easier for me to reciprocate. Despite lacking any desire for her, I continued to act affectionately, even initiating closeness, albeit cautiously, to make it easier for her to refuse. I truly had no desire to touch her ever again. An important event loomed in Marie's life. She had been elected as the new president of the Key Society, a significant charity in our city, and was set to officially assume office at a luncheon where she would deliver a speech outlining the charity's plans for the upcoming year. Marie had served on the Key Society board for three years and felt greatly honored to be named president. Nervous about her presentation, she asked for my assistance in preparing the PowerPoint portion she intended to use. This presented me with a golden opportunity. For about a week, I collaborated with her every evening, allowing her to share her slides and other materials with me, organizing them into a cohesive presentation. 
She rehearsed this several times in the month leading up to her big day, and it always went smoothly. Concurrently, I prepared my own entirely different PowerPoint presentation, ready to replace hers. The night before the luncheon, I deleted Marie's file and substituted it with mine, adding a lock to prevent her from disabling it once the presentation began. All I needed to ensure was that Mary had extended an invitation to Harry and his wife for dinner. I casually inquired, and she confirmed they would attend on that significant evening. I shared Marie's excitement, though for different reasons. Arriving early, Marie, elegantly clad in a black evening gown, looked stunning. I assisted her in setting up the laptop, conducting a couple of tests to ensure smooth playback. We all relished a fine dinner and some initial speeches. Marie was then warmly introduced by the outgoing president, and she approached the podium with a blend of timidity and pride. As applause erupted, she commenced her speech and launched the PowerPoint presentation. Initially, it unfolded as expected, showcasing images of the society's key charitable endeavors and financial breakdowns. Then, as per my scheme, it abruptly shifted focus. A sequence of still photos followed, frames I extracted from two videos depicting a couple engaged in various carnal acts. While some images were dim, the collective impression of a dozen or so unmistakably featured Marie and Harry. For a few minutes, Marie continued addressing key social issues. Then, amid a sudden stir among the audience, she turned to the screen behind her. Gasping, she inadvertently knocked over a glass of water onto the podium, momentarily frozen in shock. Soon, a vivid blush spread across her face and neck as she frantically tried to halt the presentation. By then, still photos had transitioned into brief video clips. Harry's voice rang out as he questioned how they would prevent me from discovering that she was carrying his child. He mentioned that, as long as she allowed me occasional closeness, I wouldn't suspect anything. He added that she should remember that she belonged to him. The room erupted in laughter and jeers from all corners. Marie stood transfixed, utterly dumbfounded, and too stunned to even feel embarrassed. At a nearby table, Caroline, Harry's wife, seized a vase of flowers, smashed it over Harry's head, and exited amidst the commotion. As people gradually vacated the ballroom, they cast glances back at Marie, gesturing and reliving the astonishing spectacle. Surprisingly swiftly, Marie and I were left alone. She stood on the podium, defeated and desolate. Sitting at a table ten feet away, I grinned broadly as I looked up at her. Eventually, she met my eyes, wearing an expression of profound sorrow. She questioned how I could betray her and stated that she thought I loved her, which struck me as amusing given the circumstances. I burst into laughter and made my exit, denying any remaining love for her. It wasn't like that at all. It was a delightful fantasy, but entirely implausible. I realized that the entire town would soon learn of Harry's paternity, which could jeopardize my custody of the children in the divorce. Additionally, they would resent being labeled as Marie's illegitimate offspring. I acknowledged that I should have been more subtle in my approach. Taking the initiative, I consulted a divorce attorney and collaborated with them multiple times to draft documents for future use. I then created the exact PowerPoint presentation I had described earlier, but instead of waiting for Marie's dinner event, I presented it to her. One evening, four weeks prior to the dinner, after putting the children to bed, I summoned Marie and asked her to review the draft of the PowerPoint I had prepared for her upcoming speech the next month. She snapped, questioning if it could wait because she was exhausted that day. Firmly, I asserted that it couldn't wait, reminding her that I needed to review what changes were necessary so I could make them in time. I mentioned that I did all of this for her in my spare time. I then ushered her into the office and seated her in front of the computer. Instructing her to hit the letter A when she was ready, I told her that the file would start on its own, inwardly smiling. I observed her closely. Initially, everything proceeded smoothly as she rehearsed her remarks on the first few slides of the society's presentation. Then she gasped, her face draining of color as she beheld still images of her and Harry engaged in closeness. Turning to me, mouth agape, she remained silent. I met her gaze impassively. Soon video clips surfaced, featuring conversations about his paternity of her children and her deception of me. As more scenes unfolded, Marie frantically attempted to halt the file, but I thwarted her efforts. Eventually, the screen went dark. This ordeal lasted about two minutes. 
Marie slumped in her chair, head bowed, unable to meet my gaze. After a moment, she finally spoke, lifting her head to look at me. In that instant, she seemed to age twenty years. Bill, me, I— Oh, Bill, I'm so sorry, she sobbed. I'm truly sorry. Can you ever forgive me? Forgive you? I retorted coldly. For what? Let's see. For having an affair with Harry Dorner which apparently spanned our entire six-year marriage. For bearing him two children while leading me to believe they were mine. For mocking me and disrespecting me behind my back. For denying me closeness at Harry's behest. Is that what you want forgiveness for? Her sobs intensified. Bill, I don't love him. You're the one I love. The one I've always loved. My anger simmered, restrained. I said nothing. But internally I thought, No, Marie, that's nonsense. You love our lifestyle. You appreciate how I cater to your needs, care for the children, but you don't love me. No woman who loves her husband would behave so deceitfully. I reclined, allowing her tears to flow. I relished her distress, maintaining silence during the twenty minutes it took for her to cry. Eventually, she sniffled several times, wiped her face, and looked at me. What will you do, Bill? Are you going to divorce me? No, Marie, I won't, I lied. I care too much about Katie and Brian, even if they aren't biologically mine. I let the words linger before continuing. But things will change drastically from now on. You can count on that. Let's begin immediately. Call that idiot Harry and tell him to be here in fifteen minutes. She stared at me, horror evident on her face. But I can't do that. He's at home with his wife and kids. He won't come. I grinned. Say whatever you must, but get him here. Let him know if he doesn't show up within fifteen minutes. His marriage will be over by tomorrow. She hesitated, perhaps unsettled by the coldness in my demeanor. Without uttering another word, she headed to the kitchen and dialed her lover. When Harry arrived, he wore the insincere smile I anticipated. Marie must have briefed him on the situation, for he appeared anxious and apprehensive. Come into the office and take a seat, Harry, and you too, Marie. We have something to discuss, I directed. As we settled, I wasted no time. Okay, Harry, here's the deal. You've been enjoying yourself with Marie for quite some time, making me out to be a fool. That ends now. Everything has changed, and it's time for you to face the consequences. He began to respond, but I silenced him. Sit, watch, and listen. I scrolled through the PowerPoint presentation and relished his horrified reaction to its contents. When the presentation ended, a prolonged, unexpected silence ensued. Strangely, I found myself enjoying it more than they did. Now you'll do exactly as I say without question, or your seemingly blissful marriage to Caroline will abruptly and publicly come to an end. Understand? Don't speak. Just nod, I instructed. He begrudgingly nodded, his expression seething with anger. Good. Listen carefully and keep quiet. I have several documents for you to sign. I'll give them to you one by one. You may want your lawyer to review them, so I'm giving you 48 hours to return them signed. Otherwise, Caroline will be invited to view a brief video clip. The first document acknowledges that you are the biological father of Katie and Brian and commits you to pay child support until they turn 21, along with a lump sum for their college education. The amounts are specified here, $10,000 per child per year, plus $100,000 per child upon their first year of college. The funds will be placed in a trust fund, of which I am the sole trustee, with authority to utilize it for the children's needs, I explained. Harry erupted from his chair in fury. Listen, Bill, this is utterly ridiculous. I have no intention. I forcefully pushed him back into his seat. Shut the hell up, Harry. You're wealthy and we both know it. This isn't your show anymore. It's mine and you have no choice. Now keep quiet until I give you permission to speak, I commanded. Across the room I noticed Marie looking at me with a horrified expression. This was a side of her devoted husband she had never witnessed before. The second document grants me permission to adopt the children. You and Marie will need to sign it. The third document entails your permanent renouncement of parental rights to Katie and Brian, pledging never to disclose your paternity to anyone. And lastly, a personal admission that you exploited my wife in the workplace, coercing her into an affair, I continued. What? Harry exploded once more. That's a complete fabrication. She wanted it as much as I did. Sit down, Harry, I commanded sternly. Perhaps, but Marie will still file exploitation complaint against you. It's one of my conditions for not divorcing her. 
Do you understand, Marie? I asked, turning to her. She glanced fearfully between me and Harry, offering no response. Allow me to clarify, I said to both of them. I have no immediate plans to act on these documents. Consider them my insurance, Harry, in case you ever contemplate shirking your financial obligations to our children or suddenly decide to reveal their true parentage to others, I added, handing Marie the prepared exploitation complaint. Sign it, Marie, I instructed firmly. She complied silently, still appearing apprehensive. Now, Harry, we're nearly finished with your part in today's proceedings. I expect these documents back in my possession within forty-eight hours. You can deliver them here, and should you entertain any misguided thoughts, such as damaging me, rest assured, copies of your incriminating correspondence with Marie are securely stored, ready to surface if necessary, I concluded, gazing at him disdainfully. Any questions? Taking Marie's hand, I guided her back to the office and seated her. I had never witnessed her in such a state before. She trembled with horror. It's all right, Marie. I would never damage you. There's no need to be afraid, I assured her. God, Bill, what's gotten into you? How could you do this to Harry? She exclaimed. I regarded her with some surprise. You truly don't understand, Marie. Don't you realize that what he did to you, to us, is malicious and unjust? She blushed. Yes, of course. It's plain. Well, you're so furious. It's as if you've lost your mind, she continued. I remained silent for a moment unsure how to respond. Marie, I've assured you I won't divorce you. However, our marriage will undoubtedly change drastically. Do you comprehend? I queried. Yes, Bill. I'll do whatever it takes to make amends. But what have I done to you? She pleaded. All right, I acquiesced. Let's establish a couple of conditions. Within two weeks, you'll secure a new job. I won't permit you to continue seeing Harry daily at work. It should be evident, but you are to have no further personal interaction with Harry. No touching, kissing, love-making, phone calls, emails, nothing, I outlined. Furthermore, if our marriage endures, it will be on a wholly different foundation. I refuse to tolerate your bad temper, coldness, and indifference. I expect you to be a cheerful, kind, and affectionate wife each day. Through your actions, demonstrate your love and appreciation for marrying me, forsaking the wild, uninhibited desirability you shared exclusively with Harry. I anticipate seeing you in the seductive lingerie you've kept hidden in your drawer. I expect you to be eager and willing when it comes to closeness. If you truly love me, Marie, you have a lot of lost time to compensate for, I asserted. She crossed the room and knelt before me, embracing my legs tightly. I love you, Bill, more than words can express, and I'll prove it to you, she declared tearfully. I observed her pale, tear-streaked face and fearful eyes. Somewhere within me lingered traces of the love and devotion I once felt for this woman with whom I shared so much. However, they were overshadowed, rendered insignificant by my resentment towards her selfishness and hypocrisy. She deserves whatever consequences come her way, I thought. Softening my tone, I said, Listen, Marie, in four weeks, your significant social dinner will occur. Let's utilize this time to start anew, to potentially improve our marriage. If all goes well... The dinner will be an opportunity to celebrate the success of our renewed efforts. Agreed? She nodded, tightening her embrace. Yes, Bill. Thank you for giving me a chance. I'll be whatever you want me to be. Drawing her closer, she showered me with kisses, promising to make amends. Give me ten minutes to freshen up, and then I'll begin making things right, she pledged, rising with a smile. As she exited the room, I reclined in my chair, amused by Marie's efforts to please me. The next four weeks promised to be quite amusing. I was somewhat surprised she failed to notice what I refrained from doing. I refrained from discussing the affair's details or its origins. The entire evening must have been a profound shock for her, leaving no time for reflection. But truthfully, I didn't inquire because I simply didn't care. My relationship with Marie had concluded, though she remained unaware. Upon entering the bedroom a few minutes later, I found the bed neatly made, the lights dimmed, and Marie reclining on her side in a revealing red nightgown after attending to her grooming routine. She looked stunning, as beautiful as ever, yet noticeably nervous. I noticed a bottle of lubricant on the nightstand. In a seductive yet trembling voice, she asked where I was and beckoned me to come to her, extending her arms. I quickly disrobed and embraced her. Our kisses ignited passion, her body exuded warmth, and she wriggled with anticipation. Whether playful or not, 
I relished the moment, setting aside my rage and disgust toward Marie to indulge in pleasure with her. Her allure and impatience were exhilarating, particularly after years of indifference. Surrendering to her lead, I lay back as she took charge. Afterward, she extinguished the light and nestled beside me under the blanket. She gently kissed my neck and bid me good night. As I drifted into contented sleep, I anticipated receiving similar attention over the next four weeks. I thoroughly enjoyed the subsequent weeks as Marie devoted herself to rebuilding our marriage. The next morning, she woke me with a cheerful smile and a loving kiss, offering pleasure before breakfast. I watched as she went beyond her usual routine to prepare the children for their day. That evening, she prepared an unusual meal from a cookbook, though the kids preferred their usual fare. Marie ensured they bathed and went to bed on time so we could enjoy our evening together. Our nightly closeness was a pleasant change from before. Marie wore another nightgown, and we indulged in leisurely lovemaking. Her enthusiasm, affection, and energy remained consistent. Despite my hidden feelings, I couldn't ignore the semblance of happiness we exuded daily. Marie's loving attention persisted, both in the mornings and behind closed doors. My life seemed like a happy fantasy, albeit with a lack of trust in my wife and simmering rage beneath my facade of contentment. Harry's signed papers arrived promptly, and I quickly obtained Marie's consent for adoption, finalizing the process through a private hearing arranged by my lawyer within ten days. Then my attorney handled the divorce proceedings. One morning at work, I had a surprise visit from Denise Reynolds, a colleague I collaborate with occasionally. At 28, she was five years my junior, and truly stunning. While I knew she was divorced, and her occasional flirty remarks didn't go unnoticed, I never considered her beyond being one of the women I fantasized about. In your dreams, I anticipated Denise's visit to be work-related, but it turned out otherwise. Bill, she said, what's different about you lately? You seem... I don't know, younger or fitter or something. Thanks for the compliment, Denise, I replied with a smile. Then, thinking, why not? I blurted out, actually something entirely different, but not suitable for discussion here. Maybe we can grab lunch together today. Sounds good, she agreed. We headed to the salad bar, then took our lunches to a park table and enjoyed the sunshine. The change you noticed in me is probably due to my failing marriage, I explained. She looked puzzled and that makes you look better? Please explain. I gave her a condensed version of the story. A couple of weeks ago, I discovered my wife was having an affair with a co-worker. It's been going on for a while. I confronted him to leave her alone, and since then, she's been bending over backwards to make it up to me. Here's a secret, Denise. Marie thinks she can win me back, but I've already decided I'll be leaving her in a few weeks. I can't stay with someone who betrayed me. In the meantime, she's treating me like a king both in and out of the bedroom. That's the change you noticed today, I concluded, and she appraised me with a look. I'm impressed you're handling it so well, she said. When I found out my ex was cheating, I nearly fell apart. It took me months to get back on track. I'm sorry, I offered. I didn't know you went through that, but I've taken control of my situation now. It'll unfold the way I want, not someone else's way. That's making me feel a lot better. Taking another chance, I added, one nice thing about my situation is that, even though I'm not officially single yet, I know I will be soon. So, I don't have to hold back from expressing my admiration for the lovely lady sitting with me in the park today, I said, smiling at her. She blushed slightly, glanced away, then back at me. Geez, Bill, you've put me in an awkward spot. I didn't think it was so straightforward, she said. Sorry, Denise, but you're so beautiful and fun. I've been attracted to you since we met. It's just that until now, it was off-limits to talk about it. Any chance you'll join me for dinner on Saturday? I know a charming Italian place with a river view. She looked at me seriously. Bill, I like you too, and it's always been easy with you. Can I trust you? Is your marriage truly over? Or is this just some ploy to get into my pants? Excuse my skepticism, but I've seen this scenario before. Denise, I've always been honest with you, and as you know, I've never pushed you before. I'm ending things with Marie in about two weeks and filing for divorce the same day. There's no going back. But I understand if you want to distance yourself, I'll just be a little disappointed. She smiled. No, Bill. Now that you've made the offer, I'm ready to accept it before you change your mind. She gazed at me intently, and after a moment's hesitation, I leaned in, 
and we shared a light, tender kiss. It wasn't fiery or passionate, but it felt like a beautiful promise. As we parted, I couldn't help but smile, feeling like a joyful child. When I informed my wife about my Saturday night date, it brought out a cruel side in me. I bluntly stated that I would be going out with another woman and expected her to stay home with the kids. Marie was taken aback and on the verge of tears. Bill, she protested, but I've been trying so hard. Please think of something to salvage our marriage. How can you see someone else? It's quite simple, Marie. Not only did you see someone else, but you also engaged in a six-year-long affair behind my back. While you've been making an effort lately, and I'm feeling better, it doesn't mean you automatically deserve my unwavering devotion. It's clear that I'll need to seek enjoyment elsewhere for quite some time before we're on equal footing. Her tears began to flow. Will you sleep with her? No, but I could. And that's what you need to comprehend. If it hurts you to think about, well, that's a taste of how you made me feel. With that, I exited the room, ending the conversation. My initial outings with Denise were delightful, yet cautious. We proceeded slowly. Perhaps both of us sensed there was more than just physical attraction between us. We conversed, laughed, commiserated about colleagues, exchanged childhood stories, and simply got to know each other. It felt effortless and natural, at times reminiscent of my early days with Marie. The thought saddened me, but I pushed it aside. Following our third dinner, as I opened Denise's car door outside her apartment, she softly asked if I would like to come in. We both understood the implication, and I felt an instant surge of desire. Once inside, she melted into my embrace, and we kissed and embraced like infatuated teenagers. Pulling back slightly, she confessed to me that she really wanted this, but was quite nervous because it had been a while. She asked me to be gentle and patient. I assured her with a smile, lifting her gently, and asked her which way to her bedroom. Later, I reflected that lovemaking with Denise was incredible but noticeably different from recent encounters with Marie. She started out a bit timid, allowing me to explore and caress her body. Yet, she was so stunning that every moment with her was pure pleasure. Our first carnal encounter was tender, affectionate, and far more loving than the passionate encounters I'd had with Marie. It felt like two people caring for each other, bringing each other happiness. Afterward, Denise kissed me repeatedly and asked if I could stay the night. I gladly agreed, and we fell asleep in each other's arms. The following morning, she seemed a bit bashful again, and while we didn't make love, we bid farewell with genuine tenderness, sharing several tender kisses. With just a few days remaining until my planned wedding night with Marie, I kept my intentions hidden from Denise, but mentioned that my divorce would soon be finalized. When I returned home around 9.30 on Saturday morning, I found Marie quietly weeping at the kitchen table, clearly aware of how I'd spent the previous night. Feigning sympathy more than I genuinely felt, I embraced her tenderly. I'm sorry, Marie. I understand how you must feel, I murmured. Oh, Bill, this is just awful. The mere thought of you with another woman tears me apart. I've been so selfish all these years. How could I have been so oblivious to your feelings? Looking at me with gratitude, she whispered, Thank you. Thank you for giving me another chance. Marie's significant night, much like mine, was rapidly approaching. To some extent, I almost lamented it. The past four weeks with Marie, marked by very satisfying closeness, were enjoyable, and I'll miss them. However, nothing she did even began to diminish my resentment and anger. Her utter betrayal far surpassed any attempts at reconciliation. When I examined my heart, there was only a tiny bit of love for her and a minuscule drop of sympathy for what awaited her. While collaborating on a PowerPoint presentation for her speech, I clandestinely prepared my own rendition, not precisely identical to hers, as I needed to conceal Harry's identity as the children's father. Nonetheless, the general approach mirrored hers, a sequence of photos followed by captivating videos. I rigged the laptop so that Marie's presentation would play whenever she used it. However, by inputting a specific key combination, including a passphrase, I could lock her presentation and substitute it with my unique file. In the days leading up to the event and on the evening itself, Marie anxiously asked if I had deleted the dreadful file she encountered four weeks ago. Each time, with a loving smile, I reassured her it was gone and demonstrated that her presentation was intact on the laptop. The last few days at home were particularly sweet. 
Marie began to feel more assured that she was winning me over again, and her affectionate gestures seemed less desperate, yet more serene. The pain she endured when I spent the entire night with Denise only elevated her further in our bed. Knowing that this charade was about to end, I savored every moment. When the big night arrived, we were there early, with me donning a rented tuxedo and Marie looking glamorous in a black evening dress with spaghetti straps that accentuated her neck and shoulders. We ran her PowerPoint presentation twice to ensure everything was in order. As she leaned over to place her purse under the podium, I swiftly input the key combination, signaling that everything was set and everything unfolded exactly as I anticipated. We enjoyed a pleasant dinner, engaging in friendly chatter with our companions at the table. Then, Marie was warmly introduced by the outgoing president, and she nervously approached the podium amid applause. According to my watch, her joy and anticipation lasted precisely 54 seconds. That's how long it took for the still photos of her infidelity to appear on the screen. Marie didn't freeze or spill her water, but she turned to me with horror and disbelief before futilely attempting to halt the presentation. Naturally, she failed. As the video clips played and the audience reacted with a mix of indignation and laughter, she stood there, flushed and defeated, making no attempt to respond to the vulgar remarks directed at her. Moments later, we were alone. I sat quietly, observing her from across the table. Finally, she uttered the question straight from my fantasy. Bill, how could you do this to me? I thought you loved me. Yes, Marie, I replied. In these past few weeks, I loved you just as much as you loved me six years ago. Approaching the podium, I placed several folded papers in her hand. I'm filing for divorce. Consider yourself served. If you remain in town, we'll have joint custody of Katie and Brian. Otherwise, I'll fight for full custody, and you know I'll win. Almost at the door, I heard her scream in anguish and fury. But you promised you wouldn't divorce me. You said we could work things out. Turning back to face her, I responded, Yes, Marie. So I suppose after all these years of your deceit, I lied to myself. 